Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can now find us on Facebook. I'm Julie Flygar. I'm the president and CEO of Project Sleep. Uh, and I am broadcasting to you from Los Angeles, California. And we have a very special guest with us tonight, Connor. Hi, Connor. Hello. Where are you? I am about an hour outside of Chicago in uh, Illinois. Okay, and you were saying it's getting warmer there. Yeah, w yeah, war warmer is relative, I guess. But <laughs> in the forties, high forties is pretty nice at this time of year. Okay, well, it's like low sixties here, and it's really cold. I'm wearing a sweater here. This is my winter sweater <laughs> in LA. Uh, well, thank you guys for joining. As you join us tonight, please type in where you are tuning in from. It's really fun to see all the different locations. And um, as you're watching, please don't be shy to comment and press the like button and the share button. Uh, the more engagement that you guys give, um, Connor, um, helps this story reach more people and um, helps Facebook know that this is engaging content that should be shared. So as we try to raise awareness, please be um, as interactive as you can. Um, of course, please remember that um, it, the video will be public and all the comments will stay with the video publicly. So um, you don't wanna share anything there that you wouldn't wanna share publicly. And um, if anything about Connor's story tonight brings up any questions for you about your own medical situation, please bring those questions to a medical professional, specifically a sleep specialist or a neurologist. Uh, we are doing these for educational and awareness purposes, uh, but of course we're not doctors ourselves. And um, I am just gonna share a few quick updates about Project Sleep before Connor gets started with his presentation. Um, most importantly is that it's less than a week until the seventh annual Sleep In 2021. So we're really excited for a weekend of rest and relaxation and exploring the ideas of self-care and, and um, but also raising awareness about sleep and, and sleep health and sleep disorders. So we have a really fun weekend of events scheduled, um, including an interview with Dr. Shelby Harris on Friday. She's an incredible uh, expert. Um, and then on Saturday, we'll have a, a very cool um, yoga session and um, mindful breathing exercises with a yoga instructor who's gonna join us live. And then um, we'll have a panel on sleep in your space talking about designing architecture and space uh, to make sure that sleep is prioritized, which should be really cool. And then on Sunday, we'll have brunch with CPAP Babes, uh, who is an incredible advocate for sleep apnea and idiopathic hypersomnia. And um, on Sunday night, we'll have a private Zoom meeting uh, recapping uh, from the scavenger hunt that people will be doing over the weekend. And it's really just an opportunity to talk about self-care in a private Zoom meeting. So um, that's a preview of some of the major events next weekend. So please, if you haven't checked out the Sleep In, it's free to register. And um, there's all sorts of graphics and, and fun stuff on the website. So check that out. Um, and if tonight, if you enjoy Connor's story and you have not yet participated in Rising Voices, to become a trained speaker. The application is now open for people to apply for the training that's gonna happen this summer. So um, the application is open until April 15th. So you still have plenty of time to apply to participate in the program like Connor did last summer, right? It was just last summer. Yeah, it seems like a lot longer ago than that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I think with that, we'll go ahead and get started with Connor's presentation. Uh, Connor, are you feeling ready to pull up your slides and I'll read your bio? Sounds good to me. All right. You guys are in for a real treat. So Connor Baker is a recent nurse graduate from Aurora University in Illinois. He was diagnosed with narcolepsy with cataplexy at 20 years old. Now as a trained speaker with Project Sleep's Rising Voices of Narcolepsy program, he wants to share his story to help spread awareness and, ed and end stigma surrounding narcolepsy. So please, Connor, take it away. Thanks, Julie. Um, so yeah, my name's Connor Baker. Um, I'm 26 years old. I live in a small town um, about an, outside of, uh, an hour outside of Chicago in Illinois. So 
for my story, um, starting off, I guess we should start at the beginning, wherever story starts. Um, I, uh, I was born in a small town in um, Missouri called uh, Branson, a little tour tourist attraction town. Um, but uh, really my story doesn't start until um, I was about, about eight years old. Some of my earliest memories um, are not, not the greatest, I would say. Uh, the first things I remember are of my, uh, my dad and my mom getting into physical altercations about um, who was going to have me for the weekend. <laughs> um, uh, shortly after that, when I was about eight years old, I ended up losing my mom to uh, suicide. Um, and then my dad quickly got remarried. And after that, things really started taking a turn for the worse. Uh, I um, was quickly taken out of school by my new stepmom. Um, we ended up couch surfing a lot. Uh, I lived pretty much out of a plastic bin. Um, so that way we could uh, pack, just throw a lid on it and uh, leave anytime we needed to. Um, living environment was pretty unstable. Um, it was an emotionally and uh, mentally abusive environment and occasionally physically. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I didn't really have do a whole lot as a kid. So me as a person didn't really start to come out until I was a little bit older. Um, I, what I was allowed to do growing up was pretty much sit in the corner and uh, read a book or clean the house. That's what my free time consisted of. Um, but I was allowed to go to church. Um, so that was, that was kind of where I started developing who I was. Uh, I had a lot of um, friends at church and I got to see a lot of good stuff at like church and see how other families like operated and other kids acted and stuff that they got to do. And uh, that's kind of where I started realizing, I was like, you know, the, the way that I'm living isn't super healthy. It's not super great. So I started standing up for myself and um, defending myself. I was about 15 years old um, when that started happening. And that didn't uh, go over so great with my stepmom, as you can imagine. Uh, so she gave my dad an ultimatum and basically said, uh, you know what, either you get rid of him or I'm leaving. So on my 16th birthday, my dad actually took me to a resident, residential facility and dropped me off. And the last thing he said to me as he was leaving, he said, happy birthday. And I didn't see him again for several years after that. Um, but, you know, as bad as that sounds, it actually ended up being a, a great thing for me. Um, like I had mentioned, I had gotten pulled out of school. I was able to get um, back into school whenever I got put in the residential facility. Uh, I spent most of my childhood up to that point as a pretty fluffy kid, so I was able to get in pretty good shape, um, lost a bunch of weight, lost almost 100 pounds um, while I was there. I started playing football for the first time, started playing sports for the first time ever. I started on a, uh, on a team um, my junior year of high school when I was 17 that ended up being undefeated as um, conference champs, and um, I actually ended up uh, getting back in touch with my mom's side of the family because I, I forgot to mention this, but my another thing that my stepmom had done was cut um, off all contact with my mom's side of the family uh, after her death. So I hadn't spoken to them in almost eight years. So I was able to get back in touch with them and they, uh, they ended up getting custody of me my um, junior year of high school when I was 17 and moved me down to Louisiana where they lived. Uh, the summer before I turned 18, and I ended up graduating high school um, while I was down there uh, as part of National Honor Society. Graduated on time, which was a big thing for me uh, since I had missed so, so much school. And I ended up finding um, the thing that ended up becoming my lifelong, uh, what's been my lifelong like hobby type of thing in uh, MMA and um, boxing and combat sports and stuff like that. Um, so moving down there was a great, great experience for me. Looking back on stuff, though, um, if I had to say when my symptoms began, it was probably about the same time I got put in the residential facility. Uh, I, I remember always being tired and thinking to myself, I'm like, I'm more tired than what I should be. Uh, and I was seeing a counselor at the time, and I mentioned it to them, and they basically said, and they're like, you know, you've been through a lot. 
Um, you know, you're trying to catch up on school, you're playing sports, it's normal for teenagers to be tired, no big deal. You're probably just going through a little, di little bit of depression being a teenager. So, you know, I was like, okay, that's no big deal. I can get through that. Um, but looking back on it, I was definitely more tired than what I would say is average. I slept through every single one of my classes. Um, any free time that I could get, I was probably sleeping. Um, just to give you an idea, <laughs> before football games, um, when everyone else was like, you know, jamming out to music and getting all hyped up for the game, you could pretty much always find me asleep in my pads, uh, sitting in my locker. But uh, fast forward a few years um, to right after I graduated, uh, I'm 19 years old at this at this point, and uh, nothing really changed, um, like feeling tired and sleeping all the time um, until right after I, like I said, turned 19. I remember I was boxing at the time, and um, I remember after a workout just feeling super, super tired. Uh, just one of those tires where like your body doesn't want to move type of thing. You feel like you're weighted down. Um, I couldn't think. I had, like I, I didn't know what was going on. Um, I actually had the coach tell me to uh, go home because he thought that I was, you know, getting sick because of like how I was moving and how I was talking to people. I was just, I was extremely tired. Um, but that the start happened more on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, I attributed it to pretty much the same thing I attributed being tired in, um, earlier in high school. I was just like, you know what, I'm burned out. I was, uh, I, like I said, I just finished graduating high school. I had moved out on my own. Um, so I was working all the time. I was uh, training in boxing and MMA. I was actually training for a state level um, tournament at the time. So I was just like, you know what, I'm burned out. I'm wearing myself out. No big deal. Let's just keep moving forward. But it ended up getting to a point where I just couldn't plow through it anymore and uh, powerhouse my way through the through the exhaustion um, because it started affecting, you know, just regular everyday things in my life where I was falling asleep while I was talking to people. Um, if I was sitting down, I was pretty much sleeping. Um, and that ended up getting to the point where it was affecting my ability to drive. Um, it got to the point where I was losing chunks of time. Um, behind the wheel. I'd wind up in places and not know how I got there. Uh, there's so many times that I can remember waking up um, just because the the rumble strips on the side of the road, whenever my tires were down, it was like they were lecturing me for falling asleep. But probably the most memorable time was um, one night I was driving home from work. I was working at a fast food um, restaurant at the time. It was about 11 o'clock at night and um, I'm driving home. I had just had a new sound system put in my car. I had the windows down, it was a nice night, it was, it was great. But I remember thinking to myself, I was like, you know, I'm tired, but no big deal, I'm less than five minutes from home, I'll get there. And pretty much right after thinking that, I remember seeing a fire hydrant coming towards the front end of my car at about 40, 50 miles an hour. Um, I missed the fire hydrant, thankfully. <laughs> I, my car ended up in a field on the side of the road though. Um, and I remember getting out and thinking to myself, I was like, how did I get here? And I looked down the road and I ended up making a turn and had driven down the road a couple minutes, um, just lost complete uh, track of time, didn't know how I got there. Uh, like I said, though, I was okay, car was okay, uh, but a police officer did happen to see, see it happen. Uh, so he, of course, thought that I was under the influence of something, you know, a 19 year old kid, uh, driving at 11 o'clock at night, driving his car into a field. Not a, not a good look. But, uh, so he runs me through um, some sobriety tests. And, uh, you know, I pass, um, but he's still thinking about taking me in until the friend that I had called uh, was able to show up. Um, they, they came um, to help pull my car out. And they helped explain to the police officer, you know, this isn't the first time this has happened. Um, you know, he's, fa he's fallen asleep all the time. He's fallen asleep behind the wheel multiple times. So thankfully I got off with just a, just a warning. But at that point, I, you know, I kind of realized, I was like, okay, this is past the point of being normal. It just, this, this is beyond just being tired. Fast forward a few months, um, I'm hanging out with a, a group of my friends, um, the group of guys that I hang out, hung out with, and I'm still friends with all of them uh, to this day. A uh, great group of guys, but we we definitely acted like a 
almost like a frat house <laughs> um, uh, right after high school, just doing a bunch of crazy stuff, goofing around, messing with each other, just, just, going, just doing crazy stuff. Um, I remember one of those nights when we were hanging out with each other, <laughs> I'm sitting on the couch and someone does something wild, uh, you know, was probably pranking one of the other guys. And we were all sitting there laughing. And I remember sitting there and all of a sudden um, my head drops forward and my face started twitching and my arms wouldn't move. And I like, I just felt weird. Like I, I couldn't move, I couldn't talk, it was super odd. Um, but you know, I be, me being who I am, I just kind of blew it off. I was like, okay, weird, let's keep going. Um, but uh, shortly after that, that was just the first of many, many occurrences, um, because pretty much any time I hung out with them after that point, that would happen at least once or twice. Um, and it went from just being like whenever, when I was laughing, just that would happen, um, when I would get surprised or annoyed or upset about, about anything, really any time I felt any sudden change of like emotion or like an intense emotional change, um, I could pretty much guarantee that I would, you know, be on the ground because my knees would buckle, my arms would go limp, my head would fall forward. It's just a super weird situation. Um, and, you know, at the time, I didn't know what was going on. My friend group that I was with, they didn't know about what was going on. But us being who we were, we, you know, laughed it off, joked about it, figured it, figured it was no big deal. But uh, me personally, um, you know, between the falling asleep behind the wheel and always being tired, not knowing if I'd fall asleep around them and if this new weird like collapsing thing would happen around them, I uh, I went to a pretty dark place. Um, you know, personally, got super depressed, started drinking alcohol a lot, and um, just was just it was in a bad spot and super unhealth un unhappy with my life. Um, but during this whole time, about 19 years old, uh, 20 years, I was just about to turn um, 20. It was the, the spring before I turned 20. Um, I had ended up meeting this girl, and um, I was talking to her about everything that was going on, and she convinced me to try out going to college. So I was like, you know, it's not a bad idea. Give me something to do with my life. Give me something to do with my time. Get me out of the situation I, I'm in. So um, I left Louisiana, moved up to Illinois where she lived, and uh, decided I didn't enroll in school. You know, as I'm waiting for school to start up, though, um, you know, me and her hit it off really well. She knew about all the stuff that was going on, uh, didn't judge me for it, didn't, you know, think any less of me for it. Like, I felt really comfortable around her. So, um, you know, we hit it off really well. But uh, one night after a, after a date, I think we went out to see the movies or something. Um, she dropped me off at the house and I remember coming home and just going and sitting down and uh, just saying, I was like, man, I'm exhausted. So I sit down on the couch and quickly after that, um, I had this weird sensation, like it's almost like I lost my stomach. Um, like, well, like, we, like you do whenever you go over a roller coaster too fast. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, okay, that was odd. And then I couldn't move. My arms wouldn't move, my head wouldn't move, I couldn't talk, I was super confused. Um, and then I started hearing feet running around through the house. I was like, okay, that's weird, I'm the only one home. Um, so I try and get up and look around, I can't move. I try and yell, nothing's coming out. And as I'm trying to do all this, I hear the feet run into the, uh, the kitchen area and glass starts breaking and doors start slamming. And I hear this, what sounds like this little girl, like just laughing hysterically. So this point, I'm getting pretty freaked out. Um, I'm, I'm trying to yell. I'm trying to, you know, grab my phone and call for help. But like I said, I can't move. I can't make a sound. Um, and as I'm trying to do all that, the, the laughing um, comes and I hear, I hear the feet run up behind me and the laughing stops. And uh, all of a sudden it changes into this weird, like whispering that I can't understand. Um, it honestly reminded me of something that you'd see in one of those, like, uh, horror movies like an exorcism movie or something like just the the weird like deep whispering um it just scared 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 me to death um that felt like it went on for forever until uh the the girl I was dating at the time she actually shakes me too and um she asked me what's wrong and I tell her what happened but then I, I 
I'm confused because I'm like, well, what, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing here? You dropped me off and went home. And she said that I had grabbed my, that, uh, that she, whenever she got home, um, I, she had actually gotten a phone call from me and all that I was mumbling was help, help, help over and over and over again. Um, so at that point, both her and I were like, you know, this something, something is going on uh, and maybe I needed to go see a doctor. So I go see a doctor. This is just a couple months before college was about to start for me. Um, so I'm, I'm just about, tw I'm 20 years old at this, at this point in time. Um, and uh, I'm telling the doctor what happened and the doctor just tells me, you know what, you have depression, you're having night terrors, um, you need to go see a psychiatrist, not me. Um, so he writes me a referral and sends me on my way. But I think about it, I'm like, you know, this isn't depression. I've been struggling with that, you know, my whole life. I know what that feels like, and this definitely isn't it. So I decide to go get a second opinion. I go see a different doctor, and um, I tell this doctor the same, same thing, and pretty much the same thing happens. The doctor says, you need to see a psychiatrist, not me. Um, and then I tell him, I was like, you know, it's, this isn't depression. Like, this, that's not what I'm feeling. Um, I was like, you know, this is something different. So then I keep telling them about my symptoms um, and I get to the point where I tell them about the, where I'm, I'm collapsing anytime I'm laughing or surprised or get upset about anything. Um, and at that point, their whole demeanor changes. And they're like, you know what, maybe you need to go see a specialist and they write me a referral to a sleep specialist. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not sure why they did that. I was like, what, what does this have to do with sleep? And, uh, but you know, I go and, um, the sleep specialist um, has a couple tests done and I get a diagnosis of narcolepsy with cataplexy. And I think to myself, I was like, you know what, this is great. I've got a diagnosis. I know what's going on. Um, I can take some medicine and I'll be all good. My life's going to go back to normal. No more falling asleep. I'm going to have my energy back. I'm not going to collapse. I'm going to be able to like enjoy life again. It's all going to be great. But uh, little did I know my journey was just starting. Before we go any further though, what is narcolepsy? Narcolepsy is a chronic neurological um, disorder that impairs the brain's ability to regulate the sleep-wake cycle. It affects about one in every 2,000 people or 200,000 Americans and 3 million people worldwide. Some major symptoms of narcolepsy include excessive daytime sleepiness, which explains why I was falling asleep all the time. But um, this, is, this uh, is described as periods of extreme sleepiness during the day that feel comparable to how someone without narcolepsy would feel after staying awake for 48 to 72 hours. So that's, like I said, that, that explains why I was so tired while I was falling asleep during conversations and anytime I would sit down and just felt so tired all the time. Um, then there's also cataplexy. Cataplexy, which is described as a striking sudden episode of mus muscle weakness, um, it's usually triggered by strong motions such as laughter, exhilaration, surprise, or anger. Um, the severity can vary um, from slackening of the jaw to buckling of the knees to falling down. The duration may be for a few seconds or several minutes, and the person remains fully conscious even if unable to speak during the episode. Now, this is what I was experiencing um, whenever I would laugh with my friends or be surprised by something or just really had any sudden like emotional change. This, this explained what was going on to me. Um, then there's also the hypnagogic and hypnopomic hallucinations. Um, these are visual, auditory, or tactile hallucinations upon falling asleep or waking up. Um, and as you can imagine, these are pretty, pretty scary. Um, now, I, I told you about a, uh, an auditory one. Um, I've had a couple of visual and tactile ones too. Tactile where is where you can actually feel what's going on. Um, probably still to this day, the scariest one I've ever had was I remember waking up and um, being strapped to a chair and I saw this dentist without a face. And um, I actually was able to feel the dentist reach into my mouth and start pulling on my teeth. So, um, that, that's, that kind of gives you an idea of what tactile is like. You can actually feel what's going on. Um, but those are, those are often accompanied with sleep paralysis, uh, which is an inability to move for a, sec for a few seconds or minutes upon falling asleep or waking up. It's often accompanied by the hypnagogic or hypnopomic hallucinations. Um, and it's important to know that people without narcolepsy can experience these um, hallucinations and sleep paralysis as well. 
In fact, about one third of all people experience these at some point in their life, usually during um, periods of high stress or poor sleep. For people with narcolepsy though, these are much more frequent and consistent over time. And this, this actually, this explains why I wasn't able to move um, during those uh, episodes, those hallucinations. Another common symptom is disrupted nighttime sleep. Unlike public perceptions, people with narcolepsy don't just sleep all the time. Timingness of sleepiness is off. With narcolepsy, some, someone may fight sleepiness during the day, but struggle to sleep at night. There's uh, also two types of narcolepsy, narcolepsy with cataplexy and narcolepsy without cataplexy. Uh, narcolepsy with cataplexy is um, uh, defined as um, a lack of hypocretin uh, by recent research. It's a key neurotransmitter that helps sustain alertness and regulate the sleep-wake cycle. Less is known about narcolepsy without, without cataplexy. And what I was diagnosed with was with the narcolepsy with cataplexy. How do you get diagnosed though? So diagnosis typically includes a 24 hour sleep study that includes a nighttime portion polysomnograph and a daytime portion multiple sleep latency test to record a person's brain waves. The diagnosis is mainly based on how quickly and frequently one goes into rapid eye movement or REM sleep, um, which is the dream sleep stage uh, during these tests. That, uh, that picture is my glamour shot of the night that I went in for my, uh, my uh, polysomnic, my 24 hour sleep study. Treatment varies per person. Um, there's currently no cure for narcolepsy. Treatment for symptom management varies widely, uh, but they can include wake promoting histamine directed or stimulant medications to increase alertness during the day, uh, nighttime medications to increase wakefulness and reduce cataplexy, antidepressant medications to decrease occurrence of cataplexy and scheduled daytime naps. There's also coping strategies such as social support um, through meetup groups and social media. And of course, improvement in general health through good sleep hygiene, diet and fitness health as well. Um, for me, the treatment was, has, been a, has been quite a journey. Uh, it took me six years. It wasn't until just, this, just recently this year that I found a um, combination of medications that work. And I, it took me uh, seeing three different doctors to finally get to that point. Um, so it definitely wasn't what I thought it would be in a quick, quick fix, go to the doc and it'd all be good. Um, it was definitely a journey in and of itself. Uh, but between, between that and having the, uh, the social support groups um, with people with narcolepsy, I, you know, thankfully I've come to a point now where I feel like I've got a good handle on things. But back to the story, um, like, I, like I had mentioned, I was uh, just about to start college whenever I got this diagnosis. Um, when I started school up, I had the dream that I was going to go and become a doctor and, you know, hopefully a surgeon one day. Um, and you know, whenever, whenever I uh, got that diagnosis, like I said, I thought it was going to be a quick fix. Um, I, you know, I, I was super excited, super hopeful. Um, but I started falling asleep in my classes again. Uh, and of course, that doesn't go over so well with college professors most of the time. Um, so I had a few professors, you know, say, you know, how do you plan on getting into the medical field if you can't stay awake long enough to get through your, your, your basic classes? I also had the doctor tell me um, whenever I told them what I was planning on doing that uh, what that I that I was I wanted to be a doctor and possibly surgeon. The doctor told me they're like, you know, that's going to be nearly impossible. They told me that uh, that maybe I should think about doing something else and that my life, how it was now with it being tired and falling asleep all the time and you know just stuff like that. They they said, you know, that's just going to be your life and I have to get used to it. But um, me being who I was for a while, I, uh, I said, you know what? I'm not gonna listen to that. I'm going to do what I wanna do. And uh, they um, hit home with me that maybe they were right until one day during a lab, I think I was dissecting a frog, um, but I had a uh, episode of cataplexy where it kicked in and my arms dropped and I remember actually cutting myself with a scalpel. And I thought to myself at that moment, I was like, you know what, they're right. I, I can't do this. I'm not, I'm not capable of it. So between the doubts from other people and now me doubting myself, 
I, uh, I gave up on what I thought I was going to be able to do. Ended up uh, leaving school. Um, I went and tried my hand at a few different things. I, um, I left school when I was 22. Uh, tried my hand at the oil field, didn't like that a whole lot. I tried um, uh, working in the trades. I actually ended up even opening my own business in uh, auto body repair. And um, I thought to myself, I was like, you know, I, I like this, but it's not what I want to do with my life. So I started thinking, I was like, you know what, I'm going to go back to school. And I, I figured nursing was something that I could do where I could actually help people the way that I wanted to, but not have to worry about having the, you know, my narcolepsy kick in and me hurt somebody. Um, so I, I went back to school and was super excited about that. But of course, I did have misgivings. Um, I, uh, I was nervous about the same things happening again. Um, and, you know, they, they did. I, I had professors, you know, question my ability to graduate. I, I, can't, I can't remember how many um, times I heard, maybe you should drop out of nursing school and, uh, and just come back whenever you got everything figured out. Um, I had clinical instructors that uh, I had one that actually tried to get me to fail out of nursing school because I, um, I dozed off during a post-conference um, when we were just sitting down talking about our day. Um, had students, you know, question my ability to do it. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a super, it wasn't a super uh, encouraging thing for a 24 year old. Um, I had started back, starting school back up. But like I said, I, I thought to myself, I was like, you know, what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna power through this and um, it'll all be fine. So I was able to do that, thankfully, with the help of some friends, and um, I made I made some good friends during nursing school that made sure that, like, during my uh, whenever I would fall asleep, that they would, you know, help me out with my notes, um, so that I didn't fall behind. the uh, The nurse, the clinical instructor that uh, actually tried to get me to funk out of um, nursing school. Little little did she know that I was actually good friends with the chair of the nursing program at the time, and the the chair of the nursing program actually said to her she was like you're aware that he has this diagnosis correct and uh the clinical instructor said yeah I, I i know about it and she was like then why are you why are you coming to me to uh like mention something that you already know about and kind of just blew the uh blew the whole situation off so i had i had the uh i had a really good support system through the chair of the nursing program um, then I also have always had uh, my fiance. So remember that girl that I told you about um, that convinced me to go to school in the first place? Well, me and her had stayed together through all of this. Um, and uh, we are now engaged and going to be officially getting married this year. Um, she's always had my back through everything. Um, she's always supported me, always believed in me, even whenever I didn't believe in myself. Um, so between the friends that I had made along the way, um, the, the help from the different, the couple faculty members at school, and of course her, I was able to actually graduate this past December um, with my nursing degree. I have a, uh, I've graduated with a BSN, a uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing, and a minor in Physiology. And uh, it's something I'm really proud about because I believe in 2011, it was actually rated the, by the Guinness Book of World Records, the hardest bachelor degree to get. So it was a, big, a huge accomplishment for me. That kind of leads me to my life now. You know, I, um, I live with my family who includes my two dogs. I've got a Mastiff whose name is Kratos. He's 135 pounds. Um, and then our little Bella, she is, she's our fat mama. Um, she, uh, she is a 10 year old little, or 11 year old little pit mix. And then that's a picture of me and my, uh, fiance. Um, you know, I'm also able to do things that I like and love and enjoy. Uh, yeah, we like going places, traveling, hiking, stuff like that. Um, those are some pictures that I, that I actually have been able to take, um, over the years. Uh, that, that top picture right there is a picture of uh, Colorado when we, we took a random weekend trip to uh, the Great Sand Dunes National Park, um, just spur of the moment trip. And uh, that picture on the bottom is actually of my fiance fighting because my, uh, <laughs> my, my love for combat sports um, rubbed off on her a little bit. And uh, she actually went on to become a, uh, 
a Muay Thai, uh, she won a Muay Thai tournament, a national Muay Thai tournament. So, you know, both, both of us are into that now. And that, you know, we, I like to joke about everything's a competition in the house. Um, but, you know, she definitely, she definitely knows how to keep me in my place too. So, um, but, you know, what does the future hold for me? Well, like I had mentioned in the past and like previously, like in the past, I had, uh, I loved um, combat sports. I love boxing. So I'm going to try and get back into that. Uh, I actually recently just started up again and um, I plan on hopefully competing in a uh, the state level tournament that I had never gotten to compete in that I had trained for. Um, and uh, it's called Golden Gloves. So hopefully in the next couple of years, I'm able to do that. And then I also want to really get involved in uh, the advocacy for not for narcolepsy and other rare diseases and you know just just people who have health conditions and situations that people just don't necessarily understand um i want to be able to show that you know your diagnosis doesn't necessarily define you it doesn't have to keep you in a box it doesn't have to um it doesn't have to hold you back you can still accomplish whatever it is that you want to do with your life one way i can do that though is through raising awareness for narcolepsy um because of the low awareness, even among healthcare professionals, physicians, and uh, mis misperceptions, there's an average of eight to 15 years between narcolepsy symptom onset and diagnosis. It's estimated that a majority of people with narcolepsy are currently undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, with common misdiagnoses including epilepsy, depression, and schizophrenia. So with that being said, um, I'm sharing my story today as part of the Rising Voice in Narcolepsy program, a program for the nonprofit organization Project Sleep, which empowers patient advocates to share their stories and improve public understanding of narcolepsy. So thank you guys for letting me share my story. Yay, Connor! I'm clapping on behalf of lots of other people. <laughs> thank you. Good job. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, a huge a number of people are saying congratulations to you um, on your recent graduation. Um, that's just, it's so exciting to see um, all the progress that you are making. And I think that was just a really beautiful presentation to lay out. Um, it's probably not even your full story, right? But one of your stories, right, <laughs> of your life. Yeah. And, um, I know I've said this before to you, but you're an incredible person and an incredible storyteller. Um, so we're just really, really proud to have you. Um, people are sending in some questions. So I'm gonna get started with a few uh, that I've written down already. And please folks continue to send your questions. Um, so we have, um, oh, I just wanna mention really quickly as well, people are tuning in from a lot of different places. So not, you don't have to be nervous anymore because you already finished your presentation, but we have people from Virginia, Philly, of course, Matt in Nashville, um, people from Los Angeles, France, uh, Pittsburgh, Peru, Indianapolis, and Portugal. So we're going international um, and um, all over the country. Uh, so as far as questions, um, we have a lot of questions about your education. And, and so have you thought about doing anything in sleep medicine um, as a nurse practitioner or anything like that? Yeah, long-term wise, that would be a huge, that would be a huge goal for me. Um, I'd love to get involved in like the research um, side of things. There's, I mean, you and I have talked about some stuff that I'm curious about in the past. And um, there's definitely a lot involved in the, uh, the sleep medicine and neurology and stuff like that. Um, a lot of unknowns, a lot of stuff that we know a little bit about, but not enough. And I'd love to be part of um, learning more about all of that stuff. So yeah, I'd love to be part of that. So more of the research side, you think? Yeah, um, I'd love, I think that's where I'd long-term like to go. Um, yeah. Initially though, I think it's important for me to get like uh, that bedside type of thing too. You, you can learn a lot about a lot of different stuff um, just taking care of an individual. So for first, first bedside, then maybe long-term when I'm like in my 50s, get into the research side of things. 
Um, Anne, who is a nurse practitioner um, on a board of a member of our board of directors as well. Anne wants to know what specialty uh, you work in and how long are your shifts? So I think, I mean, I don't know. I don't think you're working as a nurse yet, right? No, I'm not yet. I still need to get licensed. Um, right now I've interviewed with a couple places. Uh, you know, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to get into the health, um, the sleep health field at some point. Um, but right now I've got like a big um, calling towards, uh, I, I feel kind of drawn towards the um, psychiatric health field. Um, so I want to try that out for a little bit. Awesome. Um, and so we have, a, and we'll get to a lot of different things here, but one more question along those similar lines is um, someone want to know if your narcolepsy, if you think your narcolepsy will affect your performance as a nurse? I don't think so. Um, I think that that's a, that a lot comes in um, with the uh, knowing yourself and knowing, um, knowing how to take care of your, like your symptoms as they come up type of thing. Um, making sure you have the, you know, the right safety stuff set up, the, the you know, with whether it's like through talking through HR, timing your medication, you know, there's a whole bunch of different factors that can play into that. But um, that's why that's why um, self care is so important um, is so that you don't have to worry about stuff like that. You know, it's something that just me being who I am, I'm always going to be concerned about am I taking good enough care of somebody. Uh, but I don't think that the narcolepsy um, is going to be something that makes me worried about am I am I is it going to affect my my care of a person I think it also that you know it's sometimes we think in this framework of the negatives but also there's so many positives to your personal experience as a caregiver and what that'll make you better at your job yeah definitely it's, it's definitely lets me empathize with a lot more people yeah. and take take a lot more things uh, seriously that often get overlooked mm-hmm um, let's see. So we have someone from Vegas, shout out to Vegas. And I think someone just said from Japan. So we got, I don't know, I, I'm not gonna, I think we might have like quite a few continents, which is pretty cool. Um, so um, a question about your boxing. Uh, I think so cool that you got your fiance into Muay Thai. Is that how you say it? Yep. Yeah, that is so cool. Um, and um, so you said that you were into that before and now you're kind of coming back into it. Um, and so I was curious, why did you kind of stop? So when my symptoms started up, um, just how tired I was um, all the time. Uh, I think I mentioned like I was, I was, I was, I felt embarrassed about going out because I didn't know if I was going to fall, uh, fall asleep, like after the training sessions or anything, I didn't want to be like caught sleeping at the gym. Um, but between that and just how tired I was, um, cause I mean, work doing that level, that type of training would leave me be like exhausted for like a day or two, just after one, one session. Like I felt like everything was off. Um, for like a couple days just after, just for working out once um, so I kind of I, I let I let myself give up on it um, is, the, is the best way of, way of saying it but um, like I said you know that's that's one of those things where now that I know how to take better care of myself and I've seen like the doctors and got my treatment and everything um, right I'm able to actually do that now I still have to you know take I still have to take care of myself you know and involves a nap afterwards but, um, you know, I, I, I feel good about doing it again. And I feel like I, I can do it again. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very true for my experience as well. I really took about two years off myself from exercise for the most part and uh, came back to it. So I, I think one of the most powerful things you said, Connor, was that it took you three different doctors over six years to really feel like you found a good, you know, a better treatment regimen. That's just such a powerful point uh, and really important for people to understand. <laughs> um, this has been a journey, you know? Yeah. Uh, all right, we got, we got more questions. Uh, let's see. Oh, well, I'm gonna have one fun one and then I'm gonna read some other ones, but um, 
I am curious about your beard. Matt has said that you have a top three narcolepsy beard. Um, and so, um, but a lot of your pictures, you don't have a beard. And uh, so when did that happen? Um, it actually just randomly happened uh, when, uh, when quarantine started. Um, prior to that, it was, it was peach fuzz, <laughs> like blonde and patchy and wasn't worth growing. And then uh, my fiance convinced me to give it a shot. And here we are now. <laughs> well, it's apparently top three in the narcolepsy community. So it's pretty impressive. <laughs> Matt, Matt can speak. He probably has number one. <laughs> if he's the judge and he's number one, that's office, awfully suspicious. <laughs> Okay, so Brooke wants to know, um, she has uh, one thing she struggles with is how to respond when people call, call, um, call her out on sleeping or make rude comments. How did you respond when people would call you out on falling asleep even after, even after you had a diagnosis? So initially how I responded, um, and on, I mean still how I respond is, um, if, if I know them well enough, I try and like to tell them, I was like, you know what, I, I can't help it. I have narcolepsy, um, you know, and just because for me, that's an opportunity to uh, educate type of thing, um, help spread awareness for it. Um, and often, I mean, more often than not, it uh, that actually invokes like a conversation and gets, uh, like, like I said, gives you a chance to like tell them more about narcolepsy yeah it's from it's sharing your personal business so it's like it's up to the person to decide if they want to do that or not um, but it's something that I like me personally has felt like um from that that's how I respond is I I tell people like hey I have I have narcolepsy you know it's not something that I can really help a whole lot um but it's definitely something that embarrassed me a lot to start off with um you know, I didn't really know how to respond either. Uh, initially, when people started, um, start would make comments, I, I just tried to laugh at laugh it off or, um, you know, just laugh with them type of thing. And that wasn't, that wasn't really, I, I figured out that wasn't for me personally, that wasn't like a super healthy route for me to go. Um, because it just, it just reinforced that whole thing in my mind of like, something's wrong with me. And I like, I don't want to think like that about myself. So, you know, it's, it's something that I can't, it's something that I can't help. I can't control. I have narcolepsy and um, that, that's, that's just how I, that's how I handle it. That's a hard question. Yeah, uh, probably depends on the situation always, but it's always nice to hear yeah. other people how they <laughs> handle it. Um, so we have a question about your self-care. Do you have any self-care tips that you think could help other people? Um, probably the thing that has helped me the most is, um, is kind of figuring out what my body schedule is, I guess, is the best way of saying it. Um, so like me personally, I know that I get super tired, um, at certain points of the day. And like, if I don't take my medicine at a certain time or, um, you know, just, is things as little as small as like if the temperature in the house is too warm um like it's so it's it's really like learning about yourself and like what causes um the spikes in your symptoms um so for me personally like i know i get really tired but sometime between like 10 and noon and again between like four and six so if i have the opportunity um i you know i try and set a couple alarms because it, it normally takes a couple to wake me back up, but uh, I'll try and take a nap for about 20, 30 minutes, um, like at the beginning of those time windows. So that way I'm controlling, um, trying to control at least when my sleepiness is. And, uh, you know, timing of the, taking my meds in the morning is also super important um, because that just get, helps give me the little jump start I need so that like I don't spend the day um, in that like, constantly like brain fog and haze you know, being like tired all the time mm -hmm. yeah I think that's almost sounds like self-discovery is the first step before you can even do self-care you know yeah, you know, yeah that's why it was such a journey for me because I, I you know I, I've, I've kept saying in the thing like I'm one of those people that uh just puts puts my head down and plows through so it was I'm not the type of person that takes care of themselves 
Um, that just that just was not me at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, honestly, learning how to do that has been one of the best things that's ever happened um, for me and to me. Yeah. Um, so we have a question about whether you think that um, it may be more difficult for men to share their story compared to women. You are certainly one of our, um, you know, we have only few, few, fewer men for sure uh, that uh, participate in this program. So what do you think about that? I think it depends on the guy. <laughs> um, I mean, me personally, yeah, I'm not, I'm not the type of person that typically comes out and shares um, a whole lot, but with, uh, with developing narcolepsy and stuff like that, um, I've found the benefit in doing it because holding it in and trying to hide it and trying to laugh it off and blow it off, it, it was too much for me to handle. Um, I think like my personal opinion, I think that it happens that a lot of guys try and do that. We, we try and hide behind this. Uh, we try and, you know, just not necessarily hide behind, but we try and, uh, you know, put our head down and keep going forward and ignore that stuff is going, going on. And, uh, I think that that's kind of why a lot of guys don't share, I guess. Not necessarily bad, you know, like I said, it's just, it just depends on the person. For me, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't uh, keep, um, I keep, I couldn't keep holding it in all the time. So I think it depends on the guy. Um, and it's just a personal, personal choice. Like if, if that, if, um, if coming out and sharing helps them, that that's that's a great thing. Um, uh, you know, some some guys can just you know do it in their work, find some some type of other extracurricular activity to like you know get involved in to help uh, help blow off like stress of life and stuff like that. Um, but I know for me personally, it was it's definitely hard to share. Yeah. Well. Um... You're amazing. Um, so we have a question about, uh, and I was going to ask you how you found out about Rising Voices and how you got involved. And then someone else wanted to ask you about what that process was like and was it difficult? And, um, you know, please be honest <laughs> and share your experience with the program. But of course, you know, it's kind of awkward because, <laughs> but, you know. Um, so the process of actually getting involved was honestly really straightforward. And like, I, I felt it was straightforward and pretty easy to do. Um, uh, How did the you process find was. So <laughs> I actually found out because my, uh, cause my fiance, she's one of those, those points where she just wasn't giving up on me type of thing. And uh, I, you know, I've gone through a bunch of like really rough dark patches with uh with this and trying to figure everything out and um you know she she really pushed towards the whole you know let's let's find other people that like you know have it and you know are, are living with it and uh through her through her looking and pushing me to look that's i can't remember which one of us found project sleep but i know that she was the one who pushed pushed us to push me to find it um to get involved in it um but once once I did get involved in it, the process of um, doing everything was pretty straightforward and easy. Um, the uh, the stuff that you guys um, taught us how to do, I felt was like super helpful. Uh, I still say um all the time in my, in my presentations, just talking in general. But uh, I mean the the stuff that you taught us to, about how to share, and I mean it was really really educational, really helpful. Um, and I mean, even if you don't decide to share it like publicly type of thing, I think it's a, it's a great way to get to know other people that have narcolepsy and just, it, it helps you get involved in the community of people that, um, that like for me, I could relate to. So easy process, great time. I simplified version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it's, yeah, it's such an honor to work with people like Connor and, um, you know, his stories are so vivid um, and really powerful for a presentation uh, and very emotional. So, you know, I think it's kind of been an emotional process even to be part of, you know, uh, working through your story with you um, and very rewarding. Let's see. 
Um, I just want to mention that if you guys haven't checked out Connor in our, we did a video series about different healthcare professionals with narcolepsy. So um, when you had a lot of good questions about, you know, his experience with nursing and that, check out those videos. Uh, they share, he's one of the three people we featured in a nurses with narcolepsy video. And then we have one on doctors with narcolepsy and other healthcare providers. So um, just a quick shout out to that video series if you haven't checked that out um, for more inspiration and, and different ideas. And um, I think that's it for questions. I, there's so many great comments here. So you'll have to check out all these comments. Um, we had a shout out from Wisconsin. We had to mention Wisconsin. And then uh, our friend in Japan wanted to say, uh, good luck on your NCLEX. I'm assuming that's the, is that the- it's a license, uh, yep, the licensing test. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think that is, that's it for questions. So many great comments. Nursing is lucky to have you. Yay, we agree. Um, <laughs> and so please go ahead and we'll have um, Connor check out all these comments. And thank you guys all for tuning in. Connor, is there anything else you can think of that you wanted to share tonight? Nope, thank you guys for, uh, for listening. Appreciate it and thank you for letting me share. Yes, of course. And uh, thank you for taking the spoons and the energy. We know it takes a lot to do something like this. So um, I hope you can rest well tonight, get some good self-care in. And um, thanks everyone for tuning in. And hopefully we will see you all next weekend for some sleep in 2021 events. So we'll say good night for now. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye, Connor. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.